Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the November 1st meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Tran, Commissioner Brown, Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Kaufman Gomez, Present. Commissioner Caput, Commission Alternate Schifrin, Here. Commission Alternate Mulhern, Here. Commissioner Leopold, Here. Commissioner McPherson, Here. Commissioner Bottorf, Here. Commissioner Chase, Here. and Commission Alternate Lynn. I think we're on now. Okay, now back to our regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, welcome to the November 1st meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. We did the roll call, so now we'll move to oral communications. This is an opportunity for people to address uh, the commission on items under our purview, but are not on today's agenda. You all have three minutes. Uh, does anyone want to come forward? It's okay to, it's okay to line up if you'd like. Okay, I've talked with, my name's Kerry Pico, I live in Aptos. I've talked with many of you, and one thing that's common that I hear over and over again is that there really is no plan to have a train in the near future or even 30 years from now. So what does it cost to keep the option of having a train now or whatever? Anyway, the point that I want to say is you can keep the option in the future if you do consider a trail. But what does it cost to have, you know, to not put in the trail? This is what I want you to know what's going on now with the rail trail. Willie Brown once wrote, we always knew the initial estimate was way under the real cost. Start digging a hole and make it big. So there's no alternative to come up with more money to keep filling in that hole. So what I want you to know is that phase one of the segment seven, the estimate of construction has come in three times over the initial MBSST budget. And also you have to include the, uh, it, multiply it by the uh, overhead, the 60% overhead. So. If you take that, it's three times the initial cost. And then you look at the next budget, or the estimate for phase two, which is, let's go back. Phase one is from Natural Bridges to Californian Bay. It's flat. It's wide. It's not difficult. Then you go to a difficult part, which is right along Neri Lagoon, and that's four times the initial cost. Uh, this is all done by the city of Santa Cruz, by the way. They're public works. So this is my take-home message. If it's between three and four times the cost, and these, the first one is based on real bids, okay? The second one's based on updated estimates. If it's between three and four times the cost, three times, what is that, $130 million for the, um, the MBSST, that brings you up to about 
$380 million. If you do four times, that brings you to $508 million. So it's a cruel joke that you guys think that we're going to have any rail trail built next to the tracks um, and, and afford it. And if you want to know why, it's because you're going to have to create a whole new area next to the tracks, tracks that aren't going to be used, tracks that have no use today, no use in the future. And if you put a trail on the tracks, you'd still protect that area for um, a future railroad. And if you don't have the guts to have a good contract to make sure that that happens, that's the fault of the RTC, not the fault of political will. Okay, that's really what I want to say. We're, I don't think we can afford 300, uh, 400 to 500 million dollars for a, a trail. In fact, I say take that money, make roadways, in, uh, not roadways, but protected bikeways. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. I'm Sally Arnold, longtime <laughs> resident of Santa Cruz. Um, I also want to address the economic impacts of your decision about how to use the right of way, but I have a different perspective. Um, I think scenario B is clearly the best option from a fiscal standpoint. According to the RTC's own frequently asked question sheet, if we tear up the tracks, we may incur $41 million in additional costs. I know every infrastructure project is expensive and, and you know, you just decide this, this is our values, we're going to do it, but there's no need to add additional unnecessary costs. What I haven't seen addressed yet is the fact that 70% of the right-of-way is not owned outright but our, by our community, but is a 19th century rail easement dependent upon the operation of a railroad. As soon as we tear up the tracks, we void those easements and we invite litigation that could cost tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, ending with us having to repurchase the very same easement we already bought. That's fiscally irresponsible. For these reasons, I think choosing anything other than Scenario B is a mistake, and I think we can make B even better. The proposed Mission Street improvements are largely car-centric, but we know that when we improve the walkability of a street, it increases nearby property values, people spend more money in the area, stimulating the local economy, and it is safer for everyone, avoiding those uh, attendant costs as well. Um, according to American city planner Jeff Speck, improving the streets for bikes and pedestrians has another benefit as well. It's less expensive for the city to maintain. According to his figures, if a resident drives, it costs the city $9.20 in services like policing and ambulances. If a resident takes a bus ride, it costs the city about $1.50 in bus operations. And when a resident walks, it costs the cost to the city is about a penny. Clearly, it would be financially wise for the RTC to plan any Mission Street improvements to increase pedestrian and bike access, not speed up the car traffic in those two miles. Lastly, delays can be costly. Please take this month to consider the options in the UCS and then make your decision on December 6th. We've been planning and discussing how to best use this right of way for 20 years. It's time to act. I think it's the fiscally responsible thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just point out that we do have an, uh, a, a brief outreach uh, activities update about the UCIS. So you can speak about it now or you can speak about it uh, then, but you only get one shot at it. So um, please come forward. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Jack Carroll. I live in Soquel. Uh, when I read the uh, feasibility study, um, I didn't think uh, that rail myth would uh, continue into the future, but it has. Um, I don't know why our uh, thinking um, has um, existing rails uh, maintained. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. The train doesn't uh, uh, go through uh, the uh, density that's uh, required, the housing density that's required to support a train. Um, we have to replace all the rails eventually anyway, uh, so covering them up now uh, isn't that big a deal. Um, the same thing is true for two-thirds of the ties. Um, what I suggest is that we spend that money on improving bus service. Um, the disabled and the elderly will be uh, better served by uh, buses. Uh, the buses have those nice, kind um, drivers that help people when they need it, uh, get on and off the uh, kneeling buses. And uh, that kind of service just won't be available on a train. The, uh, uh, without a train, we can have uh, enough money to actually reduce the Metro's fare box uh, revenue uh, to zero. 
the fares could be zero, free for everybody in the county. Um, the actual um, O&M expense that was quoted in the uh, study uh, was more than double uh, the audited 2017 total fare box revenue for Santa Cruz Metro. So uh, get rid of the train, get rid of the uh, operating expenses, and have uh, twice as much money as needed to uh, reduce the uh, fares in the county to zero, which has to have a positive effect immediately on uh, our traffic. So um, what I would like to see is uh, two changes to the uh, draft report. I'd like a um, scenario B that has uh, no train service in it, but all the other elements, uh, plus uh, assume that the uh, bus fare is reduced to zero, and uh, let's see how all the check boxes look uh, after that. And uh, I'd like to also know how uh, the additional housing is going to be supported. By that I mean uh, we all know that we have a housing problem in Santa Cruz County, and we all know that we're going to have to do something about it. So how does uh, our future planning um, that, you know, the investments that we're going to be making, how do those investments support the new housing? Where's it going to go? Do our uh, roads, routes that we're proposing, will it support that? And I want you to remember that uh, all the scenarios in the investment study require us to go out into the public and ask for more money because none of those scenarios are covered by any source of funding, even the imaginary ones that might be in the study. So um, can we go out for hundreds of millions of dollars for a rail that nobody, or at least half the county, doesn't like, or end affordable housing? I think it's one or the other. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm not going to bore you with a UCIS um, thing. I wanted to tell you I was on a bike ride on Sunday. I got over to Coralitas Market. I was having my lunch and some people sat on the table with me and we started talking and he was a retired bus driver from Metro here and he and I mentioned Les White and he said oh I've got a Les White story for you he said uh, I was driving my route once from Santa Cruz towards Watsonville on Route 71 and this old lady got on the bus and she could barely get up and she had canes on both hands and he thought to himself oh this could be my mother and she said are you going to Dominican Hospital and he said yeah, well yes I am and uh, she said will you let me know when we're there so they got to Dominican Hospital and um, all that traffic there on Soquel and he, he thought to himself how is she ever going to get across all these lanes so he knew it was against the rules but he uh, stopped the bus helped her off and uh, with passengers on the bus, he helped her across the street with her holding his hand. Came back and um, finished his route. And then on Monday, when he went to work, he got called up to Les White's office. And Les White says, what you did was totally against the rules. He says, uh, I was on that bus. <clears throat> but I want you to know that the service that you gave to the customers is what makes us liked by our community. Just a nice story. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Keith Otto. Uh, number of comments that I wanted to share with regards to observations around the uh, univer the UCIS, the investment study. So first, you know, when the study was released, there was an article in the Sentinel. It noted based on data in the study that traffic flows in the evening commute were not going to noticeably change under any scenario. Seems that, you know, in the big scheme of things, we're, we're missing the mark, right? We need to get traffic moving within the county. Uh, next were the figures with regards to the costs, right? Um, 899, 832, 740 million dollars, 1.2 billion, depending upon which scenarios are pursued. Uh, Commissioner or if you noted, you know, the, those figures are estimates and they're likely to change. I appreciate that comment. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, you mentioned uh, you're concerned about um, an investment that would be a risk. Um, I appreciate uh, that comment. You know, a lot of folks, myself included, have a hard time getting my head around numbers this large. Just as a point of comparison, right, consider Measure H, right, totally different issue, completely different. But consider the dollars involved, and in particular, the process 
that will be pursued there. Measure H involves $140 million. And it goes to the voters for an up or down vote. And for that to go forward, it requires a two-thirds approval, right? Not a simple majority. I hope that whatever direction the commission pursues, that if it, um, I, it would be ideal if such a uh, proposal would go to the voters for a vote and that there was that level of support for whatever you um, choose to, to pursue. Um, you know, the costs that I mentioned are just the implementation. They don't involve maintenance. Um, you know, it was noted there's uh, on the order of half of that funding has been identified, but it's at risk by 40% if Proposition 6 uh, goes forward. There's great concerns with regards to the cost. Along those lines, I question um, why it makes any sense to invest in a rail. The ridership numbers that are in the report, 7,000 a day, I'm having a hard time understanding how that's even close to uh, reality. Um, how long is it going to take to implement? What's the opportunity cost there? There was some discussion about that at the, eight, the October 18th meeting. Um, the train is going to be a fixed piece of infrastructure. How do people get to it? How do they get from it to their end destination? It's going to be very inflexible. Um, you know, my guidance would be beyond the rail that we already have as far as servicing freight within Watsonville that's servicing the business community there. It makes no sense to invest further in rail. Um, rather, I would prefer to see the investments in Highway 1 and bus service um, for flexibility. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Brett Garrett, a resident of Santa Cruz. Um, and I just, as you know, I'm a big supporter of personal rapid transit as a as a solution for our corridors and for our community. Um, I'm working with a consultant to produce a report that I think will show that personal rapid transit is the best solution, uh, serving more passengers, using less energy per passenger, and providing better service for each passenger um, than anything that's currently on the table. So I want to plead with you to whatever decision you make about the scenarios to please leave the door open for newer technology that may provide better options than what's already been planned. Um, I've been told that scenario B would, would leave the door open, but I'm, you know, depending on how a decision is worded, it may or may not leave the door open. So please leave the door open for newer technology. Um, and also, I just, I've asked the staff to break down some of the information in the Unified Corridor Study about how the various things add up to get the results that are given. Um, I find myself being skeptical of some of the results and to show more detail would be kind of a sanity check to show that it's correct. Um, and so I, I think it's important to show more detail in some of those items. Um, and I have some time remaining. I'd like to cede my remaining time, if possible, to Mike Saint, who has more things to say than he can fit into three minutes. Thank you very much. Yes, well, uh, th uh, thank you for the generous offer. We don't, we don't cede time to other people, so. Good morning, Barry Scott. I live in Aptos, and uh, I, uh, I wanted to make a couple observations. One is that it's interesting that Measure D, thank God it passed. It was, nice, it was a great multimodal pie. But, you know, it, it's 30 years of future taxing, largely to backfill a lot of projects that needed to be done uh, 30 years ago. I hope with what we're doing with this uh, new, new, new work uh, might include more future, providing for the future. I think about, I, I've been trying to find an analogy. I mean, I love Scenario B. I'm glad it came out and scored well because it's got a lot for Metro. It's got a lot. It's got the, the passenger rail piece in there, bike uh, infrastructure improvements. So it's really serving a lot of different different modes and, and, and setting a stage for a more sustainable future for our kids, which is what we'd ideally be doing rather than backfilling. Um, I thought of an analogy. I don't know if it'll work, but I'll bet all of us, all of you all, had a set of Encyclopedia Britannica in, in your 
uh, home growing up. I did. And, you know, that was a little, bit of, a, lot, a little bit of information about everything in the world, all countries and everything, and I used to sit there and pour through those things. And I want to think of your, your uh, selections of scenarios and pieces of scenarios as being a, a little bit like that. Would you want your, you know, would you buy just classics for your children to read? Would you buy just um, poetry? Uh, would you buy just science titles? Or would you buy something that had a lot of everything in it? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm submitting to you that the best thing we can do is look way out. Let's look 30 years out and see what people are doing. Let's look at other countries and see what, what they're doing for transportation. People will use a train. I have no question about that. It's, there's so many examples of it. There's so much funding for it. And I'll just leave with this. Um, and I, I mean, metro and rail transit combined, the, sim, the, the, the symbiosis between that and, uh, and bikes, bikes going on trains, bikes going on buses, is pretty, pretty substantial. Um, a quote from Enrique Penalosa, who is, uh, was former mayor of Bogota, um, he says, an advanced city isn't one where all the poor, every, or where the poor drive cars. An advanced city is one where the rich use transit. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, uh, commissioners. Uh, Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, most of us here on both sides of the podium uh, have a lot in common. Basically, we would do anything in our power to protect uh, our families and our children and leave them a future that is safe, env environmentally sound, and sustainable. Uh, unfortunately, in this UCIS, this isn't happening. But to save time, I really urge you to read Rick Longinati's letter to the RTC dated October 31st. Uh, there you'll get information on uh, CFST's position on the UCIS. Now I want to take you into the future. Uh, imagine a picture of my family and my two and a half year old granddaughter up on the screen. Uh, here is a pretend conversation that I'd love to have with my granddaughter about 15 to 20 years from now regarding transportation here. I'm playing two parts, so bear with me. Uh, Papa Mike, I really enjoyed visiting with you and Grandma. I was so happy to be able to travel around the county without having to use a car. My favorite was the electric train, of course, bringing, and bringing my bike to use when I reached my destination. And I was really surprised on the way back to your home that Highway 1 was not very congested. I guess the buses on shoulder by themselves has become quite popular with the citizens. They seem to run quite frequently. I didn't get a chance to ride the bus on Soquel Freedom Boulevard, but I heard there's also a bus rapid transit system, an all-electric system there also. I really wish all cities and counties were as smart and progressive as Santa Cruz County. Papa Mike, I'd really like to know who these people who were, at who initiated and planned this wonderful transportation system. Well, Millie, all credit can be given to the 12 members of the RTC and staff that was in place in 2018. If it hadn't been for their vision of a robust mass transit system and having said no to highway widening and single car occupancy, uh, we would still be stuck in heavy congestion. Don't get me wrong, Millie, this was not an overnight success. They took a lot of flack from the automobile constituency, but they held their ground for mass transit. It and they are now considered heroes in the transportation world. Papa Mike, weren't they afraid of losing their jobs and maybe getting voted out of office? I'm sure they were, but with increasing threat of climate change and transportation becoming the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, also they're concerned for not only their family's future, but the people they represented. They made a bold move to, to go all in for protecting our planet and its citizens. Yes, they put aside politics, voter mandates, special interests, and even their own future career aspirations to do the right thing. When I see these people on the street today, I personally go up and shake their hand for making your world, Millie, and your children's world a better place to live. I love you, Millie. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us during oral communication? Seeing none. I'll see if there's any additions or deletions to today's agenda. Good morning, Mr. Dondero. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Um, yes, we have uh, two additions, uh, item seven, uh, some replacement pages, um, and item 26, one replacement page. All right. Uh, 
Then we'll move to the consent agenda. Uh, are there any items that members of the commission would like to pull or comment on? Uh, is there any member of the public who would like to uh, pull or comment on? Uh, bring it back to ours for action. I have a comment on item number 10, the UCS outreach. Um, I just want to make sure that when the next draft of the study is um, distributed, the changes are highlighted um, with cross out and underlined so it will be possible to see how the, the study has changed from the first draft. With that, I hear that I see the executive director nodding his head yes. Uh, I'd move the consent agenda. Motion by Schifrin. Second. Seconded by Bertrand. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. So we'll move to our regular agenda. The first item is commissioner reports. Are there commissioner reports? Uh, Mr. Bertrand. I don't have a report, but um, I'd like to offer something for a future agenda item. Okay. So I think the first speaker or one of the first speakers was Kerry Pico. And he brought up something that I've heard many people talk about, and it has concern to me. And that is the, um, I forget which segment it is. Maybe, uh, George, you could clarify that. The segments that go north from Santa Cruz and our trail project there? Well, there's, there's two projects, segment five and seven. Okay. So the cost overruns there have me greatly concerned, and I've received a lot of comment about that. And so I would like to propose, and hopefully the commission here will accept this, is putting that on a future agenda item. And the reason why I'm concerned is because if this gives us an example of what future costs are going to be, we need to know that information. Future costs for something that we are just sort of stepping into and we have no real idea. This is the first project that we're actually stepping into, and it's going to give us an idea how much those future costs might be. So I kind of like a staff report on a near item, excuse me, a new scheduled meeting as, as soon as possible because that's going to be important for us to consider. Thank you very much. Um, uh, am I correct, Mr. Dondero, that the UCIS uh, estimates how much the, the trail is going to cost? Yes. Um, well, it estimates all the projects yeah, that are I mean, being I mean, I'm just, considered. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to point out that it's actually part of that document. It is. No, I, I could accept those are estimates in the UCIS but we have an actual project that's happening now. So those aren't estimates, those are real costs. We can put so I'd like a staff on report on what the actual costs are now and what the difficulties are now. Yeah, that's well, what I we, want. We could have a staff report on the segment seven and yes. the segment five. That's, that's Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make a, one comment. Uh, last week I was contacted by, uh, I was contacted by my daughter who's going to school in Boston. Um, uh, she was contacted by an activist here in Santa Cruz about a transportation issue. Uh, one did, uh, to, they, they reached out to her in the hopes that she could convince her father, who she claimed was not doing any uh, thing to uh, protect the planet, and uh, could she get involved in that discussion. And my uh, feeling about that is it's completely inappropriate for activists to reach out to family members um, to try to convince us to uh, do things. Uh, I'm elected as a member of the Board of Supervisors. My family is not on the ballot, and uh, it was especially, uh, 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 it made me very aware given the actions of last week. So uh, I just want to remind people that w we may have different opinions on what should happen on the UCIS, on transportation issues. We're passionate about those. But let's keep it uh, within the confines of uh, these meetings or, or public meetings uh, and keep it a respectful dialogue because we're going to see each other in lots of different places. I totally agree with you. I mean, we're a member of this community. We're representing segments of the community. And we're trying to do a good job, and I totally agree with you. Thanks for bringing Thank that you. up. 
Ms. Kaufman, Gilman. Thank you. I'll just make a very brief. Um, with many efforts made on behalf of the RTC and engaging with them on how best to go ahead and reach out to Watsonville as a, a community as a whole, I believe that they have been successful with their meeting this week in getting well over a dozen people, which I think is pretty consistent with both ends of the county in getting people here and engaged. Um, as well as I'm going to be doing a little bit of information out to the RP um, in conjunction with getting more um, said in the newspaper uh, because putting an ad that says RTC is not communicating, it's just informing that there's a date to go somewhere. So having something actually in writing and engaging is I think going to be beneficial to reach out to people who won't be able to take the time <clears throat> for those type of meetings. Any other commissioners? Seeing none, I'll turn to our executive director for his report. Good morning, Mr. Dondero. Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to announce that the bike signage project, uh, countywide bike si signage project, was released for bids yesterday, and uh, staff will be coming to you on December 6th with a recommendation for a contractor. Um, there is a time clock on some of the funding for that, so we, we need to get that project uh, going. Um, and just the other item, I was just wanted to respond uh, to one of the previous uh, comments and also to Commissioner Bertrand. Um, this is actually not the first project that we've uh, delivered. Uh, the um, auxiliary lane project between Soquel and Morrissey was, uh, 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 RTC was the lead on that, and the bids on that project came in well under the est engineer's estimates. And the reason for that, of course, is that because the economy was um, in a real downturn at that time, and, and the bidding was, uh, uh, contractors were basically bidding at cost at that time just to keep their, their workers going and their equipment moving. So um, it's, it's one of the um, uh, challenges of delivering public works projects in that you have to deal with the ups and downs of the economy, and the pricing, of course, varies according to supply and demand, and right now all the contractors are in high demand. So. That's, that explains a lot of it. We'll put some more detail in the staff report, but um, I, I think it's, it's something you all probably have heard at your, um, your, your other uh, city council and supervisors meetings that projects are coming in high right now. So um, it's, it's just part of get, getting it done. That's all I have for today. I'll be glad to answer questions. All right, any questions for Mr. Dondero? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to item number 22, which is a nominating committee for the 2019 RTC Chair and Vice Chair. Um, as been, has been our practice, uh, uh, I as Chair form a subcommittee to, to select the, the Chair and Vice Chair. Uh, it usually includes the current Vice Chair, which is uh, Mr. Bottorf. Um, but there, if there's others who are interested in being involved, please let me know. Uh, we generally try to have a city council member and a member of the Board of Supervisors as chair and vice chair. That's been our practice. So I know Mr. Bertrand has uh, expressed interest, but if you're interested, uh, please let me know. I'm not sure if there's any other comment about that. Any comments from the public? Uh, then next we'll move on to uh, what I think is a, a great accomplishment for the year, uh, item number 23, which is the Executive Director Employment Agreement. Um, uh, earlier this year, uh, Mr. Dondero uh, announced his uh, retirement from the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Our, uh, our commission uh, decided to hire uh, a recruiting firm to help us ensure that we looked far and wide for the best uh, people possible uh, to fill this position. Um, we uh, received a number of applications and we did a first round interview. Uh, that included both uh, the subcommittee of this uh, commission as well as a technical committee that included staff and other transportation officials. Uh, they selected uh, two candidates for the full commission uh, to interview. We interviewed uh, those candidates um, and we're very pleased uh, that uh, Guy Preston ha ha was, uh, was selected and accepted our offer as uh, the new executive director of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, Mr. Preston uh, was uh, in some ways right under our nose. He lives here in Santa Cruz and uh, he has uh, 28 years of experience in uh, transportation and the, what was impressive to us was his work up in Sonoma County working on delivering projects from their sales tax measure. 
Um, uh, Mr. Preston will be starting on December 6th or December 3rd, uh, so he'll be right. Uh, uh, he'll be coming right on board uh, as we uh, conclude the uh, Unified Corridor Investment Study. Uh, but uh, I think it'll help provide a uh, great direction for him about uh, the goals and aspirations of this commission. I want to thank the members of the staff who participated uh, in that process, and I want to thank the thoughtfulness from all my fellow commissioners um, for being part of this uh, process. Uh, we, uh, I thought that there were great questions that came from uh, commissioners. Um, I felt like we engaged in a really good conversation about this. Uh, and I'm really excited about Mr. Preston starting. Uh, so today we have his employment agreement, uh, and uh, we'll take comments and a motion when time's appropriate. Mr. Bertrand. So I read over the employee benefits and um, would like to tell the public that um, our future director will be receiving the same health benefits as staff, the same retirement plan, and paid leave. So he's not given special treatment over and above our regular employees. Also, I'd like to uh, comment on John's uh, comment on uh, Highway 1 improvement. I've been traveling Highway 1 up in uh, Sonoma, Rin, that whole corridor for years. And I brought this up in the interview with Guy. Um, that program, that project was handled in sequences that was not interfering with traffic flow in general. You know, something wasn't planned, then something jumped on top of that and completely gummed up the quarter, which is pretty bad to begin with. A lot of traffic uses it. And I noticed that as I was driving north over the years, um, well planned, well executed, uh, a lot of consciousness given to traffic coming in and out for the various communities. Um, so I think if um, when he's on here and contemplating all the plans that we have for merge lanes, et cetera, I think he's going to give a job that's well worth uh, the salary he's getting, which I think is reasonable, and it's going to lessen the impact to this community, which is something I think we could all appreciate, especially those coming from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Uh, is there any member of the public who would like to comment on this item about the employment contract? Seeing none, I'll bring it back. Approval of the employment agreement. Second. Motion by Schiffer and seconded by uh, Bottorf. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? A motion carries unanimously, and uh, we will get to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Preston here on December 3rd. Thank you for everyone's participation. On uh, Next, we'll move on to item 24, which is the Caltrans report. Good morning, Ms. Lowe. Good, good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I would like to start by reinforcing Caltrans' commitment to helping communities plan for sustainability <clears throat> into the future. And we're offering $40 million in grant funding statewide in three different programs. I think I mentioned this uh, opportunity um, at a prior meeting, but I want to ma make sure you know that the grant, the deadline for applications has been extended now to November 30th. The three programs are Sustainable Communities, uh, Partnership and Trans, uh, excuse me, Partnerships and Transit, and Adaptation Planning. And the majority of the funding uh, allowed, allotted to this program is also through Senate Bill 1, the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017. Uh, we look forward, to, we're always getting a lot of good uh, proposals for this. It's a very competitive program, but it's a very successful program. We're proud to support that. Meanwhile, at the federal level, I'd like to mention that the US DOT through the Federal Transit Administration is supporting transit coordination projects that will improve access to health care. They have a $6.3 million uh, program that's available now for applications uh, due November 13th uh, to improve access and mobility partnerships, uh, again, in, uh, for specifically for transit and access to health care. Meanwhile, the uh, investments afforded to us through SB1 were putting right to work to, in, um, to restore and preserve the infrastructure. Already, Caltrans has completed 53 projects around the state, totaling more than $15 billion. Much of this uh, afforded through the Senate, Senate Bill 1 Road Repair and Accountability Act. In Santa Cruz County alone, um, as shown in the report in your packet here, there are uh, several projects totaling $51 million that are either in development or in construction right now through the SHOP program that Caltrans uh, manages for the state highway system. 
uh, and of course there will be more coming, assuming things carry forward. We've, we're keeping track of our progress as well. We've replaced, uh, we've, we've repaved about 740 lane miles of pavement. We've replaced 37,500 feet of guardrail, 950 highway light and signal systems, and uh, repainted 2,000 miles of roadway for, uh, with better striping that you've seen for higher visibility and better safety all around the state. And uh, that's it, if, unless you have questions for me. All right, well, let's find out if members of the commission have questions. Um, seeing none, let's see if any member of the public has any questions. Okay. This is not a chatty group today, so uh, it will be unusual. Uh, we'll move on to item number 25, which is the City of Watsonville report. Good morning. Thank you very much. Good morning, commissioners and staff and members of the public. I'm Maria Esther Rodriguez, Assistant Director of Public Works here at the City of Watsonville. And welcome to Watsonville. There's a lot happening here, and I'm going to tell you what's happening on the transportation realm and things that uh, the commission here has helped us secure in funding. <clears throat> Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> Thanks. A, just a Again, a lot happening, and here to share that with you, I'll start with some roadway projects that we're working on. Watsonville has several roadway projects that provide multimodal improvements and use transportation funding secured through the Regional Transportation Commission. Fundings from various sources, including uh, State Transportation Improvement Program, State Transportation Block Grant Program, Measure D, SB1, and Highway Safety Improvement Program. These projects reconstruct or upgrade facilities for pedestrians, bicyclists, transit users, and drivers, and include some of the following. Um, a quarter mile on Airport Boulevard from free to the city limits, that was completed earlier this year, and that project is uh, one that included uh, pavement reconstruction, pavement widening that improved uh, and installed bicycle lanes, uh, better pavement for cyclists as well. It relocated a bus stop that was in a tricky location and it's, a, and, and it's now been uh, upgraded. It also in, in installed pedestrian safety crossing there at one of the crossings that we've had past uh, uh, incidents of collisions and made, making that safer. That was recently com completed, and so I invite you to go and take a drive out. There's some flashing beacons at that pedestrian crossing, so you'll see which one it is. The next uh, airport boulevard we're working on is actually happening right now. This is about three quarters of a mile on uh, airport boulevard from Westgate to uh, Larkin, uh, from, to about Home Road. Uh, that one also includes a lot of pedestrian uh, facility upgrades. We're in installing sidewalks where there were none, reconstructing the pavement, which will provide, again, safety for uh, bicyclists as well as uh, motorists and transit users, and uh, also upgraded uh, um, pedestrian and ADA facilities throughout that corridor and a upgraded and safer crossing at Home Road. The next project is on Green Valley Road, and that one's about two, uh, 0.2 miles from Struve Slough to Freedom Boulevard. That's about where Home Depot is to Freedom. It's an area with all, also uh, desperately in need of road reconstruction, and it does have, uh, it is lacking in pedestrian facilities now, and this project will address that. And the next one would be uh, Freedom Boulevard from Alta Vista to Green Valley. That one's about 0.6 mile. It's the next uh, series in the, in the Freedom Boulevard projects that we have, our heavily, our most heavily used corridor. And that one is scheduled to be done in 2022. And uh, we'll look forward to that one. Hey, I don't have the magic touch. There we go some traffic operation improvement projects that we've been doing with um, this has been um, we've had two uh, projects that provide adaptive traffic control system 
through grants secured from the Monterey Bay uh, Air Resources District through the AB 2766 program and our matches through gas tax funds. These projects optimize traffic flow along these corridors and um, making it more efficient and reducing gas emissions. The improvements to the Freedom Boulevard corridor were done last year and work on the Green Valley corridor is beginning now and uh, will be starting to get implemented next year. The next involves a lot of planning, outreach, and education. We do have a number of, uh, uh, again, planning, outreach, and education programs and projects underway. These include Caltrans planning grants to develop complete streets plan for our downtown area, and a second planning grant developing complete streets to schools plans for the 15 schools within Watsonville city limits. Both of these are have been projects that we've been having a lot of public engagement and a really concerted effort to do outreach to members of all ages, of all backgrounds, languages, residents, business owners, and we really have had a lot of input. So it's been successful to date and we haven't um, reached the final, uh, reached the end of those projects yet we're working on, but really pleased at the engagement we've had on all of those. We also have a state transportation block grant funds uh, used to prepare a plan line for Freedom Boulevard, and this is in, in the portion from Green Valley to Freedom, I'm sorry, Green Valley to Buena Vista, uh, at the edge of the city and county limit. And we also had a project, Open Streets Watsonville, that was also um, led by Bike Santa Cruz County, and this also is very engaging to all members of the community and providing open streets that gives an opportunity to people for people to know what other modes of transportation they are. It included a lot of education and a lot of activities, a really fun event. I'm not sure if anybody here had an opportunity to participate in Watson Bills, but I invite you to do so in the future. Um, also, Vision Zero is another project we have that we're in the works on here in Watsonville. Again, safety is one of those items um, of most concern and residents engaged in this in this project we are in the planning process to do that as you may recall the city of the city council approved the plan to start working on vision zero early this year and again the community has been very engaged very interested the next are bicycle and pedestrian projects the city has used measure d state transportation improvement program and urban greening project grant funds to complete several pedestrian and bicycle projects at this past fiscal year. These include bicycle and pedestrian safety education at local elementary schools. This is with Walk Market and Bike, Bike Smart. We have also installed uh, additional street lighting and flashing beacons, installing sidewalks where none existed previously, and we reconstructed a popular pedestrian path near a middle school. During the past fiscal year, the city also secured funding from the State, Tr State Transportation Improvement Program, the Active Transportation Program, and the Coastal Conservancy to design and construct several valuable pedestrian and bicycle projects. These include installing green lanes on several arterial roadways, improving bicy bicycling and awareness to motorists that bicycles um, need to share the road with us, providing pedestrian and bicycle safety improvements on Lincoln Street that will benefit Watsonville High School. And this has been a collaborative project with the high school. We've been working with them and they're very excited about this project happening. Um, and that is a location where Watsonville High School, Lincoln Street cuts through the middle of their high school and it's a roadway that's a soft closure during the day where students have to cross multiple times. So it's gonna greatly improve the safety in that area. And the last one is the design of a 1.4 mile pedestrian path along Lee Road that will link the city's rail trail project to the Pajaro Valley High School. The city is also developing two regional pedestrian and bicycle projects that use state transportation improvement program and active transportation program funding. These include segment 18 of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic 
trail network that will extend from the city limits at Lee Road to the intersection of Walker Street and West Lake Avenue. The project will go to bid late next year, so we will have real costs coming up very soon on that project. Um, the second project is installation of a bicycle and pedestrian bridge at Harkinsloo Road Crossing of Highway 1. This is one of those projects that's um, really been of uh, importance to members there at the high school. We see the students walking and traveling to the high school, and it's a very uh, congested and difficult location. Um, we're currently working with Caltrans to develop the environmental documents, and currently the construction is scheduled for 2022. Next on, another topic of conversation that we've heard not only at the local and state level, but the national never level is the infrastructure and the state of our infrastructure. Uh, as you may recall, pavement condition index is a way to measure the condition of an existing roadway. The score ranges from 0 to 100, where 0 is failed and 100 is a brand new road. This slide shows the road condition and the maintenance or repair needed. So um, note that the higher the PCI, the lower the cost of maintaining or repairing the road. The goal is to keep the PCI at 7 or above at good so that the roads are in good shape and the maintenance or repair costs are minimum. In Watsonville specifically, the current PCI is 54. To bring it to 70, it would require about $6 million a year for 10 years. Watsonville currently receives a total of 2 point, almost $5 million annually in funding between gas tax, SB1, and Measure D. While the city is fortunate to have new funding sources such as Measure D and SB1, additional monies will be needed to raise the city's PCI to 70. And also noted here is that 2.4 million is d used for more than just the maintenance on the road. It, it also uh, deals with our lighting, our street light maintenance, our sidewalk repair. So it, it's really funding that has to be really stretched. It is also uh, funding that is used to leverage grants for other uh, specific projects, but that is indeed our funding source. On a statewide level, uh, the city figures for PCI and funding are similar to those of the entire state. Uh, pages 19B1 and B2 in your agenda packet include a summary of the recent state publication of the California Statewide Local Streets and Roads Needs Assessment of 2018. This assessment states that the current PCI for all roads within the state is 65. It notes that the statewide PCI will decline to 57 over the next 10 years if the only funding is the $2.1 billion available through gas tax. It says that with the addition of SB1 funds, the 10-year average annual funding would increase to $3.1 billion and the PCI would only drop one point. The assessment says that the annual cost to raise the PCI to 87 would be $6.8 billion for a 10-year period. Like the city, the state will need a, to find additional funding sources if it is to raise the PCI of its roads, and that impacts everybody. The last slide I'd like to leave you with is a beautiful view of one of our fresh water sloughs in and around Watsonville <coughs> from one of the city's many <coughs> trails. Um, this is, uh, you're invited we're going to invite you to a public planting day at Hazelwood Park at 10 a.m. on November 17th, where the city and Watsonville Wetlands Watch partner to reconstruct the existing trail and will plant up to 1,200 native plants, including 10 large trees at that location. That way you can come and enjoy uh, what beautiful things Watsonville has to offer and be part of what our projects we're doing. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Uh uh, for uh, City of Watsonville, Ms. Goffman-Gomez. I just have a complimentary comment there as well. Um, the Vision Zero that the City of Watsonville has adopted uh, was invited to participate with a conference in New York, and uh, so we're the first small city um, that has been invited to a Vision Zero conference, um, and we will have one of our council members attend and participate that, and hopefully we'll see a report back. But they were very... Um, interested in hearing uh, from such a small community like ours that have adopted that and want to um, engage uh, 
some uh, city of our size in the big conference of Vision Zero. Great. Others? Uh, Mr. Bertrand. Uh, yes, I'd like to comment about the uh, trails around the slough, a uh, friend that lives there, and um, I've walked them many times, and Watsonville really has a great facility for the public there. It's wonderful. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? See if there's any member of the public who has questions. Please come forward. Uh, thank you, Maria. Um, I was bicycling on Tuesday uh, through Watsonville, as common, and um, the best way to get from downtown for me to get over to Larkin Valley anyways is to go up Cry and go around rolling uh, hills, and then I come out on Nielsen Way to Green Valley, um, where the project is currently uh, underway, uh, repaving and working on uh, curbs at on long um, sorry uh, airport excuse excuse me airport in in Nielsen and uh, when you try to make a left turn uh, on a bicycle anyways uh, from Nielsen on to airport going towards the freeway um, there's no sensor on the uh, roadway and I always have to uh, go over and push the button and then get back and to the left turn pocket and uh, is that part of the uh, project on airport at Nielsen Way in front of the old, uh, in front of the hospital site? Let's just see if there's any other comments. Seeing none, maybe uh, you can come back up and just uh, respond. Yes, indeed. Actually, as part of that project, we are uh, improving the detection at that particular signal. So we have video detection going in, which will definitely be programmed to pick up bicyclists. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, sharing with us uh, the work of the city of Watsonville. Um, it, it's very exciting to see these uh, improvements being made, and it's great to see that the public investment, uh, both through the Measure D and SB1, um, is really helping out in, uh, in the city. And it's a good reminder that uh, we as a community and we as a state have uh, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to say whether these funds get to be kept here um, in Watsonville and throughout Santa Cruz County when, with Proposition 6 on the ballot. And uh, if, uh, if Proposition 6 passes, you could see what a, a big hit that would be to City of Watsonville um, and it would be to all the other uh, transportation systems in our county. So remember to vote uh, next week. Uh, now we'll move on uh, to item 26, which is amendment to the fiscal year 2018-19 budget and work program. Um, Mr. Mendez, good yes. morning. Yeah. Good morning, commissioners. As you know, uh, each fall, the staff prepares a fall budget amendment for consideration by your Budget and Administration Personnel Committee and, and by the RTC. The budget uh, that's proposed in, uh, and in front of you today is a balanced budget that implements the RTC's priority projects, ongoing programs, and Measure D. As you know, one of the main sources of transportation funding in Santa Cruz County is the Transportation Development Act which is a half cent uh, sales tax from the state sales tax that comes to uh, each county for transportation. Uh, and most of those funds uh, go to Santa Cruz Metro for their operations. In fiscal year 17, 18, the TDA revenues came in about $430,000 above uh, the projections. And the RTC tends to use those funds to build up reserves and to make additional distributions to TDA recipients or to fund uh, needed uh, projects. Uh, this budget proposes to use those funds to meet the TDA and RTC reserve targets and then distribute the remainder to the cities and the county for bike and pedestrian projects. Um, and that distribution is based on population. Local jurisdictions have recently been e expressing a significant need, uh, especially as project uh, bids are coming in significantly higher than the engineers' estimates. And since November 2016, another main source of transportation funding in Santa Cruz County is uh, Measure D. Uh, the proposed budget includes a new page on Measure D uh, listing uh, the Measure D funds carried over from the prior fiscal year. Um, the budget also includes funds received from the state. One of those uh, funding sources is the state um, uh, transit assistance uh, fund, STA. Uh, SB1 
more than doubled the amount of uh, SDA funds for Santa Cruz County and added the state of good repair funds uh, to SDA. Uh, in August, the State Comptroller's Office issued uh, revised estimates, increasing the amount of SDA by about $700,000. This is reflected in the proposed budget, and all those funds are apportioned uh, to Santa Cruz Metro. Now, the RTC has been implementing projects, as you know. One of those is the countywide bike signage project. Uh, it's, uh, and the, the budget shows a carryover of funds uh, for that project. Now, after a number of years of developing the project, it is finally out to bid, as uh, your executive director uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, as has been mentioned many times, bids have been coming in significantly higher than engineers' estimates uh, for all construction projects, and it is anticipated that the bids will come in significantly higher for this project as well. Therefore, uh, more funds are needed for the project, and this proposed budget uh, proposes that $49,000, or about $49,000, in uh, regional surface transportation program exchange funds that, that remained after the completion of the Highway 1 Silcota Morris Auxiliary Lanes project be reprogrammed to this uh, county bike signage project to uh, uh, help with um, where the bids uh, might come in for, for that project. This may not be sufficient uh, to cover uh, the cost of the project depending on where the bids come in, so the RTC may have to consider additional funding after the bids come in. Um, in the planning program, uh, we do include an addition of $200,000 in Measure D highway corridors uh, funds to help complete the Unified Corridor Investment Study. Uh, significantly more consultant and staff work has been necessary to produce the study and conduct all the public outreach. Uh, now, in the past, the RTC did program $625,000 in Measure D rail corridor funds. And as you know, this study is looking at the rail corridor, the highway, as, and also um, the Soquel and Freedom uh, Boulevard corridors. So uh, here it is proposed that $200,000 uh, uh, that is needed now come from the highway corridors part of uh, Measure D. Now, the staffing resources section of the budget incorporates the recently approved uh, labor agreements. Uh, and then a, a number of other changes throughout the budget that are noted. Uh, the Budget and Administration Personnel Committee did review the budget and does recommend uh, your approval. Um, there are a couple of uh, additional uh, recommendations from the staff that just weren't ready uh, at the time with the uh, BNA committee, and those are the reprogramming of the uh, RSTP exchange funds to the uh, countywide bike signage project, which is uh, recommended by staff. And then also amending the, the uh, Measure D five-year program of projects to add the $200,000 uh, of Measure D funds uh, to the uh, Unified Quarter Investment Study. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time of the Budget and Efficient Personnel Committee, we, staff did communicate that, we were, that this would likely uh, come to you, but we didn't have all the final numbers because we were still negotiating with the, with the consultant. And the, the amount of money that is proposed for the consultant is course, uh, lower than, than the con consultant initially wanted, because that's what we, we do. We negotiate with the consultants and, and get the best uh, deal that we can for the commission. So with that, I'll take uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mendez. We'll uh, have questions. Mr. Johnson. Okay. Speaking of consultants, I mean, you piqued my interest. Okay. So you're talking about, is this Kimberly Horn? Yes, it's Kimberly Horn. Okay. And how much have we spent in consultant fees so far on the whole UCS? I want to say it's, uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, it's, it's, I, it's a little over 500000 over $500,000 that, that we spent in consultant fees. 500000 I believe it's about 500000 500, or so, yes. I thought you said we gave 625000 625000 was provided by the RTC. Um, uh, but that's not just for consultant costs. It's also for all the staff work, and it's been a significant amount of staff work as well. Okay. So you're asking, and uh, so out of that 200000 60000 is going to go additionally for staff work? That is correct, yes. And another 140000 for, uh, I guess, the highway corridor. Am I hearing you correctly? Uh, what's 140000 for the overall uh, consultant work? Uh, I mean, if we, if we were to... Uh, uh, you know, parse out how much of the work has been associated with the highway corridor, it would likely be more than 140,000 worth of work. So why wasn't this done uh, during the whole UCS uh, study to begin? I mean, the study of the high, the, or the highway was a big component of this whole corridor, and yet you're saying that it wasn't uh, fully addressed during the initial corridor study? 
the high, we're not saying that the highway analysis wasn't fully addressed. It, it has been uh, fully addressed. It's just that the funding was cut, you know, came from uh, different sources uh, previously. One of them was from a, a um, Caltrans planning grant that was received by the RTC, and then another one was for Measure D funds. Uh, so. So what's going to go? What what kind of things are they going to study about the highway that uh, re requires another two hundred grand? It it's not that they're going to study um, you know uh, an additional one hundred forty thousand dollars worth of analysis on the highway. They have been studying the highway as part of the project throughout. Uh, so that's that has been happening. Okay, so you're making my point. Why do they need another 140,000? What are what are they going to study about the highway that we don't already know? Uh, they there's still you know, uh, I mean there's been a lot more consultant work necessary to, for for the highway analysis as well as for the other analysis that has been necessary on this uh, on this study, um, and that work isn't yet done. Like so, what? Um, well, they are continuing to to analyze uh, uh, the various uh, uh, performance measures and um, projects as we're getting also the uh, comments from the public uh, on uh, you know, what the public would like to see. And they are going to be producing um, you know, a final report. So that is, it, it's taking a lot of work to take all the comments from the, pu from the public and everyone to you know, analyze things uh, accordingly and then produce that next report for you so that it would be a valuable report for you to, to make, try to make a decision. The analysis from the public and the comments for, for the public purportedly were uh, anticipated in the initial uh, uh, bid and so forth. Why do they need more money for additional comments and reports and so forth? It just seems like uh, so much money for something that should have been covered, and you're not you're not really giving me details in terms of why we this this commission to spend another two hundred thousand dollars on a study that purportedly should have been uh, worked on in the initial study. I, I can't really support hard-earned tax dollars going to another two hundred thousand for something like this. I'm sorry, um, Mr. Schifrin. Let me try to clarify my understanding about what what's happening here. This additional money is really to pre prepare the second and final draft and to respond to comments. Is that correct? Uh, that is primarily so, yes. We've received, I, I know of just looking through the agenda um, um, correspondence, we've just received voluminous comments. We're having all sorts of public meetings, the previous meetings of the commission, and people have raised a lot of very technical questions. I don't think it's possible to have anticipated when we were doing the, um, when, when the contract was first uh, uh, proposed and approved, that the extent of the comments and the details of the comments and the, and the additional work that might be, resp uh, to, uh, be re required. The commission uh, wants, I know, I assume the commission wants to provide uh, competent, complete, if not complete, at least extensive responses to the comments so that members of the public who have commented and, and uh, other agencies that have commented will feel like their comments were taken seriously and an attempt is made to give them a serious analysis and response. That takes a bunch of money. I, personally, I'm not surprised, having lived through a number of environmental impact reports where the draft comes out and then the final, um, based on a lot of public uh, involvement, increases the cost of the contract. That's, uh, that's not unusual. Um, I think, from my perspective, it's worth spending the money because we want to have the consultants provide a response that will be uh, a detailed, meaningful response to comments and not just uh, slapdash because uh, the commission has, there isn't enough money to really have them do further analysis. So um, I, from my perspective, the, um,
not desirable to spend more money, but given all the testimony that we've received, um, the reports from other con uh, traffic consultants raising a, a bunch of concerns, I want those concerns taken seriously. I think it costs money to have our consultants, the Commission's consultant, take them seriously, and I think it's important that the Commission support the additional money to, for the necessary staff work and uh, consultant work. Um, can, are there, uh, can no, okay, Mr. Justin. What, what's wrong? Are you well, I'm, I'm, uh, if, if the two of you are just going to argue the point, I'm, I'm just trying to get other comments from uh, other uh, Well, I was just uh, going to respond, okay, because it's a d direct response to what I said, and I want to respond to what he said. Okay. Is, is that a problem? Um, uh, uh, I'm well, giving why you the you, time, Mr. Johnson. No, why don't you go to other commissioners, and I'll wait my turn. Okay. Ms. Kaufman-Gomez. Um, thank you. Uh, my, my question had to do with that as well, but um, I think between hearing both sides of things, um, first of all, I thought it was services rendered already and we had the money come from another source and we're switching where the money is coming from to then pay for those services. So that's sort of the question that I had about the 200. But in the dialogue, it sounds like it's for services from to complete what they've started at that last, um, you know, 5% of the, the work that needs to be done for us to get to the December point. Um, so that was my question about that, the 200,000 and where it came from and what it was for. Um, and I do have line 39 about Measure D. There's a 602,000 and it says recently programmed. Can you help me with recently programmed? I just want to understand. Do I? Um, the page is, it's line 39 um, in the report. Let me see. Sorry, let me get to the right line 39. There's lots of 39s. Yes, every page has it. Um, let's go with 26-13, line 39. And it says 602-87, that's the difference. But I don't know, can you just help me understand what recently uh, programmed means? 26-13, line 39. Correct. Yes. Um, I mean, there's uh, verbiage the, I don't know yet. Yeah, That's why. Yes. Yeah, the Regional Transportation Commission, through its uh, five-year, um, well, approves a five-year program or project for Measure D, and through that, the RTC program uh, funds for um, for different uh, um, uh, highway projects, and then the RTC also program funds in <laughs> December of 2017. Uh, that also included funds for highway projects, and so that's that's why that's there. So recently, program is that carrying forward? Is that another term for that? Well, it's, it, it wasn't yet. The funds were not yet in the budget. They were programmed, but were not needed yet. So they weren't in the budget. They weren't in the budget yet. But now they're being added to the budget. So. Okay, and um, the other thing is page twenty six sixteen, the RTC reserves. Um, what is our reserve policy? And um, page twenty six sixteen. Yeah, uh, the RTC's rules and regulations state that the RTC should have a 30 percent um, uh, reserve, which is 30 uh, percent of uh, operating costs for the agency. And where we currently sit with the, that um, policy? With this, the with this budget, uh, you would meet that reserve uh, target for the very first time. Yeah, this, is, this has been a longstanding effort to try to get this uh, reserve set up. Good. It's a good it, accomplishment. And there's more than one target, too, isn't there, for the different buckets for reserves? Uh, there is also a reserve for the Transportation Development Act, and that is um, an 8% target for that. Uh, and, and that's 8% uh, of the revenues that come in from, the, from, uh, from TDA, and that is to help the RTC meet its commitments during, during the fiscal year for all the uh, their recipients in case uh, there are changes in the in the funding as it comes in and sometimes it has happened where the funding came in below uh, projections and those resources had to be used to to meet the commitments okay and again if it's eight percent are we there based off of this budget on okay. this yeah we would be there yes. and then my my last question and thanks for your your patience no, that's helpful. um I, it's on page 26 dash 21 how we want to soquel the auxiliary costs uh, they went from one and a half million to 2.75 after the competitive procurement. Um, and I think maybe the word consultant is in here as well. Um, 
aren't we doing some of our own design work? Why did we have such an incremental cro cost on that if we're looking to do more projects either in-house or um, Caltrans in, is taking them over? So can you help me understand where we brought that price up in terms of what that bid, what happened with that bid? Uh, yes, unfortunately the note doesn't, uh, this is a limited, doesn't, doesn't communicate all, all the information, so I apologize for that. But partly is also that we did not have um, you know, sufficient funds in the budget at that uh, uh, previously uh, to help cover what we need to say would, would fully be the, the costs uh, for that. And um, um, we were able to then uh, you know, add to that based on the uh, uh, Measure D five-year program projects that the RTC approved and the, the bids you know, recently for, for that work uh, did, did come in because the RTC did actually go out and, and uh, request uh, consultants. Um, and we do have a consultant on board to do that work now. And so now the, the amount here is based you know, uh, on the uh, bids that were received and, of course, the funding that the RTC had, had already programmed for the project. And this is part of the effort to speed things along. That, that is correct, yes. We're, we're right. trying to advance the design to try to speed things along. So. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bator. Uh, in relation to the handouts you passed out, the two new pages we got, um, I appreciate, as Mr. Schiffrin mentioned here, when, when we do get these, if the changes are, like, highlighted with the changes, it makes it easier for us to just look at them because we get them this morning. Uh, my question is on this attachment 2614 that we have. Yes. I didn't see any changes on it. Is there, is there something I was supposed to see? It's, or It might be a little bit difficult to see, but it it's, is. Ba it's basically line number eight on that, and it is just the, the, ne the text on that line that, un unfortunately, the, um, uh, what you received w was incorrect because originally um, staff had proposed that that, um, uh, that money from uh, uh, the TDA um, uh, go to a different project, and after the b and the Budget and Business Personnel Committee, that recommendation changed. Okay, so staying on that page, because this is what my question is, if we drop down to line uh, 47, yes. bike signage project, is that money already there? Oh. That's not actually all there uh, with this budget. If you approve the recommendations, and that money would be there, because one of the recommendations is to uh, reprogram uh, money that remain from the uh, uh, Highway One Square to More Six Lanes project, and that oh, money. So would be the there. 292 is not there. Oh no, well, the 292 is the 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 new money, the 326 thousand that. that Okay, so the bike signage project is not a three hundred thousand dollar project, more or less. It's a six hundred thousand dollar project. Um, well, we want, we don't know for sure yet until we get the bids. Um, well, the, right now I see there's two ninety two that's been approved. It's going up thirty four thousand. And, and and Why then it's and then it's proposed to three twenty six, and that's an estimate on the cost. So, but that money is there. Is that that's what I'm trying to understand? There's, isn't there an ATP gr grant? The, uh, yes. th that we're running out on, and then this is uh, reprogramming some RSTP funds for what you expect might be overage when we get the bids in. That is correct. And, and the majority of the ATP grant carries over from last year. We haven't spent most of it. So. The 292 I, 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 is there. Th thank you, Joy. That, 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 my question is, the 292 is there. It looks like there's an a, 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 a cr increased pot potential of 34 that may not be there. That, that no. It is, it is available. Okay. Yeah. It, Through the RSTP? Or? It, no, no. It, it was uh, left over from the auxiliary lane project after we made settled the claims. We had money set aside for, for that, and this was, this was left. Okay, so, so I'm just trying to get my hand, because there's nothing here that tells me the, the, the magnitude of this bike project. Right. I, and I was perceiving it as an approximate $300,000 project. Right. It appears now that it looks like about a $650,000. No, it's about a three hundred thousand dollar project. Okay, then why are we asking for another two hundred ninety nine thousand dollars and uh, to be to be put in there? No, you're you're asking for to move a thirty four thousand into that project, and that's the money from from the Highway One project. Okay, because when I go to the notes here uh, from the the uh, the um, meeting of the budget committee, there was st uh, some residual money residual TDA money that normally goes to Metro in the amount of right. approximately $300,000, we'll come to call 298, whatever. 
And that money was designed not to go to Metro, but the recommendation with, on this hand that I just got out says uh, it's going to redistribute that form. This is the recommendation of the committee to uh, other jurisdictions for bike signage projects. So mm -hmm. my, it leads me to believe that there's a $300,000 project and another $300,000. Nope. So, so help me with that. You said, okay, so the, the, the TDA money is what's showing up in line eight. On that on that same page, okay, uh, okay. and that was the recommendation of the B and A committee. To, that was uh, maybe Mr. Schifrin. Who yeah, well, well ma maybe I could try to explain it. Um, at the budget and policy uh, uh, subcommittee, the initial staff friend recommendation was to use the uh, the additional TDA money that came in over budget uh, for what was expected uh, overage on what was needed for the bike signage project. We had a robust discussion and uh, the committee voted to instead put that TDA money uh, into the local jurisdictions um, rather than putting into the bike signage project. But see what, Since, it says here? what it says here? Alternate funding source for bike signage project. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to, I, 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 But can you see my confusion? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. that's why I'm trying okay. to explain it right now. Keep going. Keep so, going. and then, if I understand correctly, uh, since the Budget and uh, Policy Committee, the staff has identified that there is uh, a little bit of money extra after closing out all the pieces on the, on the auxiliary lane project um, that we have $34,000 that we could put in, which is less than what the original um, TDA overage was going to be to cover what might be some extra expenses given that things are coming in higher right now on bidding. So it's, it, this, is, this is different than what we talked about in the Budget and Policy uh, Committee. That's on our agenda. That's this money. That's the RSTP money that's going to cover the overage. That's what they're asking for us to vote today. I, we have an uh, authorization for $48,000 to cover an overage. And I understand that because in my mind, I see this as a $300,000 project that may become a $350,000 project. But I don't know why, if the, if the 292 has already been budgeted and you're going to get the 48, which is, comes up to three and a quarter, why is it required to take the TDA money, another 298,000, and put it into this? No, uh, no, no. Where is this money? Where the, is this the, 292? The, the 292 comes from the ATP grant that the commission has already received. Right. Correct. That's correct. Yes. So we got a grant for this pro uh, for, for the bike signage project. It has a long, torturous history that, that I'm very familiar with because I got this commission to put money toward the bike signage project from a different funding source, and they held off on doing it. And then they've got this ATP grant, and we've still been waiting years for it to happen. And now we're finally going to get it done. Uh, and they were trying to use TDA money to help cover the overage that that wasn't. It's well, let me just, let me see. Maybe this is not correct here, because maybe what you're trying to say is that the money is, the 298 that's left over from TDA is not going to go to the bike project. It's just going to go to distribution to the other cities. Is that what you're trying to say? That's correct. So yes, the sir. line in here where it says for bike signage is, in, is not correct. This is the corrected copy I just oh, got is, today. Is that, is that from the, that's from the, uh, that might have been the, the staff report in the uh, budget committee. No, right. no uh, let me read it, because I'm not. Uh, is it confusing? Not if you read it carefully, I think. I think that from you, I take that as a compliment. So go ahead. No, okay. because I think that's always a problem when we get things at the commission meeting, because we're expected to sort of understand okay. them. Um, and this was one where, unfortunately, the original minutes were incorrect. So staff has corrected the minutes. And what it is is that the committee um, recommended that the commission approve the proposed amended fiscal year budget with the exception of the 298,475 in TD8 funds for the bike signage project and that instead that money be distributed by TDA formula to the local jurisdiction, cities and county, and that staff present the RTC alternative sources of funds for the bike signage project. So the 298 was, dis you know, the recommendation of the committee was that that be distributed to the local jurisdictions and that the staff be directed to come back with other funding sources to try to supplement the amount of money that was available to the bike signage project. 
I'm crystal clear. Thank you, Mr. Schiffer, for explaining that. I'm sorry for delaying that, that oh. topic. Okay, it's, I, and, I, and thank you. And we, just because we're going to come back next month with, with the bike signage contract, hopefully, we don't know what that amount's going to be. It just went out to bid yesterday, so got it. as I previously I, announced. So I, uh, hopefully I, I, we've, we've got it covered, but we don't know for sure. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would just say there's one other change now looking at these draft minutes. It says that uh, uh, Virginia Johnson was there, but actually Supervisor McPherson was there. Oh, that is correct, yes. Was there a fifth person? Oh, yeah, and Tony Gregorio oh, was there. So, was so there. It, it should say Gregorio instead of Johnson. No, no, it should say McPherson, and it should also no, include. You're right. It should Gregorio. say Gregorio right. instead of Johnson. Gregorio instead of Johnson would give us the five people there. Okay. Well, yes, you see. And it shows here Mulhern, Johnson, Schifrin, but it should say Mulhern, Gregorio, Schifrin. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was looking at them on the front page. Yeah. Just trying to make it clear as mud, okay? Yeah. Mr. Caffett. Oh, um, Mr. Mulhern? We'll you, go after him. Okay, okay. Mr. Mulhern. Um, just a, I have a. Qu quick question about the, it's now many minutes ago that we were discussing it, but um, we were talking about um, uh, the, the, the funding for the, univer uh, the Unified Corridor Study, um, and we had said that, the, that we had $625,000 in initial funding, and we are going to be adding another $200,000, uh, and we are, there was also a Caltrans planning grant. How much was the grant? It was about 300000 300000 okay. Okay, and so, I mean, I, I, I also I agree with Commissioner Johnson that we, we should have assumed that we were going to get a, a, a surfeit of technical questions based on our experience with the Highway 1 um, EIR that we got a, a thousand comments, many of them very technical in nature. We, we should have anticipated with, with our constituency that we were going to get a lot of technical questions. That, that being said, I, we, we still need to complete, we still need to answer those questions, so we still need to pay for those. So I understand the, the $200,000 allocation. I just, when we're doing these things in the future, we should assume that we're going to get technical questions. Um, then uh, to, uh, to Commissioner Bottorf's questions about uh, the, the bicycle signage program, it, the, the proposal that came to the, to the committee was to spend this $298,000 on the bicycle signage program. Um, we made a motion to not do that. So, so yes, the, the anticipated cost at, at the committee meeting was that this bicycle signage program was going to be $600,000. And that, that was part of the discussion that we had, was whether or not we should be spending $600,000 on science. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Caput. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, actually, this discussion is important because it's clarifying a very confusing part of the, uh, you know, allocation. But anyway, I'm I'm satisfied with uh, what what I've heard. But uh, on uh, 26.5, uh, just to um, you know to make it clear. Uh, to the public, uh, is it is everything we're talking about is taxpayer money, of course. It does say uh, one-time cost sixty-eight thousand, result of increase in executive director position, and uh, also payout of vacation and sick leave. Now, what what is the limit on how much uh, uh, vacation? Uh, hours somebody cannot use and then get it use it as a retirement uh, parachute uh, per the uh, lever agreements that you have approved it's two and a half t times what could be earned in one year for 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 vacation and then uh, uh, sick leave i can understand sick leave more than vacation but go ahead how many hours there's well, no limit on that yeah uh, there is a limit but it's, but it's quite high so that's what i remember uh, so, you know, it just, you can pretty much, it's almost like there's no limit. You're right. Uh, I don't know. But quite high is. The, anyway, I, don't, I don't remember I know, the number off the top of my head. Mean. Okay, yeah. I, I don't expect that. But, but pretty much no limit. You're right. Sure. And then I guess w the one thing I just want to make clear when it came to the uh, hiring of a new executive director, uh, I was questioning how we're going about. Uh, with the starting pay of the new executive director. Uh, when you have an outgoing one, you have somebody who has like maybe 15, 20 years of experience, and then somebody new who has not had the position comes in as actually getting more. 
so anyway, I, I just want to make it clear that I was not uh, uh, I was not satisfied with that uh, that amount we we ended up coming up with. Thank you. Okay, hey, other uh, comments on this end of the table? Go back to Mr. Johnson. Thank you. So, uh, again, I want to talk a little bit about consultant fees. You know, Kimberly Horn is doing our general plan amendment, and we got comments. We were anticipating maybe 100 people who commented on the, on the website. We got 800. So that is an increase, uh, eightfold increase, apparently, um, from our con constituents in Scotts Valley. We didn't raise uh, and give any more money uh, based on that. I'm just looking at, uh, and again, doing the math, $60,000 uh, for staff time at $50 an hour is another 1,200 hours of staff time to uh, complete this. That's 150 work days of a staff member working on these, th this item. And if you go at 140000 for Kimberly Horn, at $150 per, that's over 900 hours of time, of hours devoted to, quote, this completion. I mean, we're handing out, I realize it's close to Halloween, but we're handing out dollars like candy. And I, I can't really support it. Sorry. Other comments? Now we'll open it up, see if members of the public have comments. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. I'm just here on a very uh, narrow portion of your overall agenda, which is that topic you just uh, discussed earlier about the TDA uh, LTF uh, ec uh, additional revenues that came in above budget. Um, that, that uh, $434,684, I believe, that was referenced. Um, so what I'm here to do is to ask you to, to follow your past practice and that is to treat those dollars just as you do at the beginning of the year. At the beginning of the year, you go by the controller, their staff goes by the state controller's estimate for TDA LTF dollars, and then those get uh, programmed. And uh, when they get programmed, there is money that goes, if needed, to replenish the TDA and the RTC reserves. There's money uh, oftentimes um, placed in RTC admin and planning. <laughs> And then the remainder of the money goes to community, community bridges, the county, the cities, and Metro, with Metro uh, receiving 85.5% of that by your own policy. Um, so uh, with, with that, I went to the uh, budget committee and asked the budget committee just exactly that, to respectfully please follow your past practice. Uh, it's not only just about the beginning of the year allocation, but my staff went back and researched all the way back to 2010. And between 2010 and 2018, there were three years in which excess revenues, excess TDA LTF revenues came to this county. And in all three of those years, staff followed that exact same policy as they do at the beginning of the year. Look at whether some needs to go to admin, planning, replenishment of pots, the remainder, 85.5% to Metro, and then community bridges, county and city splitting the rest. Staff did that in all three of those excess years going back to 2010. Um, we're simply asking you to do the same thing here. Look, that amounts based on the numbers, the updated numbers given out today, it appears that's about $255,196 to Metro. Uh, that's a little over the third of a cost of a bus. And as you know, and as you hear my refrain over and over, no matter where I'm at, Metro needs to replace its equipment. Out of our 98 bus fleet, we have about 60 buses today that have to be replaced. That's a $38 million proposition if those buses are compressed natural gas, and it's a $60 million proposition if they're electric. And as you probably know, the California Air Resources Board is soon to mandate that we must begin buying 100% uh, zero emission buses and become a 100% zero emission uh, transit agency um, by 2040. So that's a big undertaking with very expensive vehicles. We must cobble together every penny we can to replace that fleet. If we do not, then we fail to deliver what we have a mission to do, which is to provide service to the customers. Because our buses break down, we become undependable, and customers won't stay. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us about items on the budget?
Hey, Michael Sane again, uh, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Just been taking notes on all this uh, conversation going back and forth here. Um, and I really wanted to thank uh, Deputy Director Luis Mendez and his staff for the hard work uh, in forming this budget. Um, the TDA funds to the bike and pedestrian trail, I think that was a good thing to shift those over. Um, also, the STA funds to Metro, great idea. Bike signage project. Uh, Mr. Um, Mendez said there might not be enough money to do this bike part of it or complete it appropriately. I think we need to pull funds from where you can to make sure the bike signage project is completed as planned. Um, and taking those from the old Ox Lanes project was a great idea. Uh, the $200,000 more for the UCIS, I really emphasize not to cut the public short in answering their questions on this UCIS program. I know 800 questions are extremely high, but having public input is one of the major criteria of democracy. So please approve this plan. I, it's an extra amount of money, but the public needs to be heard. Also, being fiscally responsible and reaching that 30 percent uh, reserve is a good thing. So I recommend approval of the, the new budget and the changes and amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Barry Scott, Aptos. Um, I, uh, one thought I have about budgets, and I've, I've spoken with uh, folks about this. Uh, I don't know how many people realize, most that I speak to don't know that the Highway 17 bus is an Amtrak bus. Um, I wonder if uh, the uh, staff has looked into, I imagine they, they have and would, look into whether or not state rail plan funds can be used to support shuttle services to uh, rail stops so that we have an integration of uh, our rail transit and our bus, bus uh, system. That's all. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us on the budget? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to our Commission for Action. Uh, Mr. Bantor. I'll go ahead and start. I, there seems to be a couple issues here. I'm going to, uh, the Measure D money, which, uh, you know, I'll let someone else weigh in on that. But I, I want to address the uh, the, the uh, TDA money. That's that's particularly what I'm here for. Um, I have a problem. Uh, as, as Mr. Clifford mentioned, you know, I, I've got the, uh, the budget sheets that I have here that clearly shows that the past practice of the RTC over the years is to allocate when there is a surplus uh, funding to allocate it to Metro. It's what we've done consistently. And when I go to our, um, these are actually the rules and regulations of the RTC. <sighs> Measure F, or item F on page eight states, any surplus funds, which is what we're talking about here, uh, the surplus funds are 434,000 less the RTC costs, which we've already said go into topping off the, the, the uh, reserve buckets. No problem there. There's a residual amount of approximately, I'm going to ballpark it, $240,000. It says, any surplus funds remaining in the local transportation fund after accounting for the adequate reserve shall be reported to the commission and appropriated by the commission during its fall budget, which is what we're doing here. The intention of this provision is to maintain the allocation priorities established in Section 3C. And those priorities are 85.5% to Metro, 8.4% to uh, community bridges and 1% to volunteer center. Um, however, the commission retains flexibility to appropriate a portion of the surplus to other high priority activities by special allocation. Well, since the committee recommended not to fund the bike program, they recommended just to give it back to the cities and counties, that in my mind does not equate to a priority. That just means more of a distribution of the Measure D allocation for roads, which is a 30% bucket, which is the highest bucket we approved. So I don't see a special circumstance in here. But what I'd like to do is try to make a motion on this particular item, and, I'll, uh, and I'm, I'd like to weigh it out and just see what, how it floats. But what, what I'd like to do is go back to the uh, original allocation. Um, as was mentioned here, this bike program is important. So, I mean, I'm here right now, and I'm representing people like Yannicka Strauss, who is not here, and I'm here representing uh, Ray Cancino from Community Bridges, who's not here. And if we ignored in these, these two people, I'm sure we'd hear from them down the road. So uh, my intent is that the TDA money be allocated under the regular formula 
but I'm going to hold off a portion. I'm going to recommend that we match from that fund. It looks like we've set aside what's on our agenda today is to allocate 48491 from RSTP money into that fund because we don't know how it's going to go. Because what I really didn't get a clear answer on today was how, whether this is a $300,000, $400,000, $500,000, up to $600,000 bike program. So, but any money we put towards is good. So uh, you're recommending 48000 from RTP. I'm going to say that I'm going to use the intent of this measure and allocate a portion of the money and match that, 48941 from the TDA money into that bike fund. And then the remaining goes to Metro. So that's going to be my motion on item, um, on, on when it, uh, the recommendations in the staff recommendations say the budget recommendation. So that's how I address the budget and item one. I don't know what, we, what the, the feeling of the board is on item two, whether to go ahead, but for the sake of the motion, I'll recommend staff recommendation. So yeah, so just to, to clarity, instead of doing the whole budget, we're just going to talk about the TDA funds. Uh, if you'd like to break it up into two, well, well, I, I just want, or if you want to do the, I can do the whole thing. I, I'm okay with recommending staff recommendation for the two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, and I will include that in my motion. And if it turns out that it falls apart because of that, but my, I'll, I'll repeat that the motion again is that we stick to the residual, the four hundred thirty-four thousand, give or take. Uh, after the uh, RTC deductions are made, it leaves a balance of approximately two forty. We follow the formula so that uh, community bridges, volunteer center, and and Metro are funded at their percentages after taking off the uh, a matching fund of 48,941 to the bike program. I'll second that. All right. So there's a motion and second on the floor. Mr. Schifrin. Yeah, uh, um, I don't support the motion. It's not a surprise. And I'm going to make a motion to amend when I'm done making my comments. But I would like to clarify a, a, a couple of points. Uh, one is that the recommendation of, of the Budget and Administration Committee to uh, take the uh, surplus funds and distribute it to the local jurisdiction is based on the fact that the bike and that the local jurisdictions uh, spend the TDA not on road projects but on bike and pedestrian projects, and these are high priority projects. And in fact, um, they just like the uh, the transit district have a huge backlog of projects that um, they they are trying to fund, and so the notion that um, that money should uh, only go to the transit district, I think, is um, a little bit misplaced. I think normally it does. In the past, I've supported the money going to the transit district. Usually, the transit district comes with a particular program that they sp want to spend the money on, um, and not just to have it put into, uh, just put it into their general budget. And particularly this year, when the transit district is getting excess funds of, over se of around $700,000, it seemed to me that this might be a legitimate year to give the local jurisdictions who get a very small percentage of TDA money on a regular basis. Um, and let me just remind the commission that giving 85.5% of the TDA revenues after administration to the transit district is a discretionary decision. It's not required by state law, and the commission could change that. The commission has been very generous to the transit district over the years. <laughs> Justifiably so, and I've always supported that, and Commissioner uh, Kuhn, the third district com uh, commissioners have always supported it. But it is discretionary, and the, the, the transit district has great needs, but it also has great resources. It gets a half cent sales tax, it gets a portion of uh, Measure D money. This year it's getting uh, um, the STA money. Uh, as well. So I'd, it just seemed to me that it was legitimate on a one-year basis to try to provide a little extra benefit to the, um, f to the local jurisdictions for their high-priority projects. Um, and I, I don't think that that's unreasonable. I don't think it sets a precedent. The reason why the, the regulations say what they say is to provide some flexibility to the commission when it deals with its surplus to look at what's going on uh, in, a, in a particular year and make decisions uh, based on that. So I'd like to make a motion to amend the motion on the floor 
to simply approve the staff recommendation on this item, which would uh, include the, 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 com the committee's recommendation on the distribution of the TDA funds and the uh, additional money for the bike signage program and for the, um, the, the uh, UCS uh, study. Okay, Would so that there's be a now substitute motion. Is well, it's 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 a it's a, mo it's a movement to amend. It's it basically uh, substitutes. I'm not willing to amend my motion, so it has to be a substitute. It, well, motion. It, it, that's why he needs a second to see whether someone uh, uh, will second his uh, amendment. Is there a second? I I, I need some questions answered. Is that okay? Uh, you, well, uh, I just want to see if the, the if it's on the floor or not. Um, but, but I need some clarification before I would can second, second it, and then we can discuss it. But we're but uh, I want to see if there's a second for his motion. Uh, yeah, I'll second it. Okay. All based right. on so, if I'm reading this correctly, and again, um, we're looking at a proposed budget for Metro of seven million seventy four thousand dollars, then. The difference then adding zero of this 298,000 and then giving an additional. So out of that proposed budget, I'm just looking at Scotts Valley gets, we don't get 7 million, we get 31,000 for things like signs and what, what have you. And then we're just asking for our city another $13,000. So if we give this all to Metro, you're saying you want to deny the, the local jurisdictions uh, just a, a small little bite at the, this uh, 298000 I guess, you know, maybe we support Metro. I've ridden Metro in the last uh, two months, uh, I'm happy to say. I also ride bike, though. So I don't see why we shouldn't be able to have another 13000 for our citizens who uh, by the way, during Measure D, didn't get its quote fair share. Um, so I think to recapture for Scotts Valley, um, I would support this. So yes, I would, Andy and I don't agree on a whole lot, but I think having a small, a small little bite for our for our for our city is uh, probably a good thing. So thank you. All right. So we have uh, a motion on the table to amend the motion. Right. So we were having discussion. Uh, it's about the amendment. About the amendment so basically it's about allocation and um, I, I hear um, Alex's comments and I think something that's not on the floor here is um, who rides the Metro um, there's going to be an immense requirement on Metro's part to upgrade and the reason why there's upgrade requirements is because the buses are breaking down and in my campaign for city council here in Capitola, excuse me, I'm in Watsonville, in Capitola, I received many comments about that issue. And these are riders that depend on their schedule, that's metro schedule, to get to work, perhaps after getting their kids to daycare and stuff like that. Metro needs reliable buses. And so that's why I support the intent of the comments from Metro and those on this board that support Metro. <coughs> that's it. Mr. Caput. You bet. Uh, actually, just a clarification here. Uh, if we had a motion for an amendment, and then now we have an amendment to the amendment, no. I, I oh, don't, no. we, we have we, to have two separate we, votes. We had uh, the first... We had a recommendation. Okay. Then we, the first motion that was put on the floor was to change the recommendation we got from staff um, in the allocation the way that Mr. Bottorf uh, explained. Some for bike signage, the rest for Metro, community bridges, and volunteer center. Then Mr. Schifrin made a uh, motion to amend the motion uh, to go back to the original staff recommendation. All right. And we're going to vote on that amendment first, and then we will vote on, on, the, uh, on the original motion. Uh, if it's still, okay. if, if the amendment doesn't pass. All right, then just for my clarification, maybe everybody else here has uh, understands this and I don't. I, I, it is a little confusing here. Which one benefits uh, the local communities and Metro the most? Well, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, matter, that's a matter of uh, uh, perspective, right. right? I mean, the, the Metro is going to get TDA money 
they would get more TDA money under the uh, proposal by Mr. Batorf. Right. Uh, the local jurisdictions would get more money under the proposal by Mr. Schifrin. All right. I'm going to go with the local jurisdictions. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, hold on, Mr. Mulhorn. Uh, thank you. Um, I just just very briefly this this is act, this decision is consequential and it does actually set a precedent because the RTC hasn't yet exercised its discretion to divert TDA funds away from Metro or not go with the policy and our the the formula in our policy. So it, this is consequential. We will reflect back on this vote when we look to redirect TDA revenues to other TDA appropriate uses in the future. Yeah, I, I think that may not be completely accurate. I'll look to Mr. Mendez because yes, I think I'd we've like done to, this before. Uh, I'd like to uh, yeah, uh, correct things. Um, the Commission has in the past exercised that discretion a number of times. Uh, uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Clifford did say that they looked back to 2010. If you go back further, uh, you would see that there were tides when actually all that money went went to Santa Cruz Metro because they they had needs. There was one year when it all went to uh, Lift Line because they had certain needs. Uh, so it has varied. And most recently, when the when the RTC had a need to try to develop a a uh, transportation sales tax measure, which ended up being Measure D, uh, the Transportation Commission decided to use some of the, uh, I don't know if it was all of it or practically all of uh, the surplus money that we, that we had at a certain point to um, uh, pre-up uh, funds uh, that could be used to uh, develop that measure. So the commission has to exercise that discretion a number of times. I just wanted to get the clarity about that. Uh, so I'm going to try to get the people who haven't spoken yet, um, Ms. Kaufman Gomez and then Mr. McPherson. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to just, let's do the math on this. Uh, we have 298,000. Um, the carve out is about 48 going to the bicycle um, signage uh, kind of situation, leaving about 250 that would then be divided between um, Metro and then uh, the volunteer and the community, um, bridges. community bridges. That's correct in terms of the math there. Um, the question that I have here is, of the 298, if it were to go less admin and what the other part of it was, towards the bike signage, what programs do we have in play between the different jurisdictions ready to go with this check to be cut to the community? I mean, I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know where to go with how much money the different cities are looking at from this that can go effectively if, if this is allocated different, you know, to them? I mean, that is for each local jurisdiction to decide how they, they would uh, spend that money. But typically, we do get, on a, on a regular basis, uh, requests from the local jurisdictions for bicycle and pedestrian projects that get funded with uh, TDA revenues. I think and they were actually uh, were a couple in your, uh, in your uh, consent agenda today uh, that, that you know, did ask for those TDA revenues that they, they've been getting to use for bike and pedestrian projects. So this will be prioritized based on the report we have here on those cities that have something ready to go, or is this going to be equally distributed for allocation? It gets distributed by formula. It's a population formula. And so then whatever money the uh, local jurisdictions get, then they decide how to spend that money they get by that formula. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McPherson. Yes, I'm, I'm going to vote against the amended motion and for the motion by um, Director uh, Batorf. Um, you know, Metro, Metro is our transportation, our public transportation system in Santa Cruz County. And if we want to give it the attention it deserves and we would want to increase the ridership in that, I think we have to continue our commitment to giving to Metro when the opportunity presents itself. And that is why I'm going to be supporting um, uh, Director Botorf's uh, motion and uh, voting against uh, the amended motion. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lind. Yes, and I, I want to take this time to appreciate the um, partnership that, that we have benefited in Scotts Valley that will be on our agenda coming up for the um, bike route uh, signage program. And we've also been beneficial of uh, benefit of projects and Glen Ken or Green Hills Road and some of the projects that have been really wonderful to have. But I think I, I agree with uh, Director Botteroff that we have a severe situation with Metro, with buses catching fire, with uh, 
and, ex and being mandated to, to uh, comply with state requirements, federal requirements, and going to uh, completely energy efficient buses are going to be very expensive. So I think this is an opportunity to continue the support and the policies that have been in place. And, uh, and I believe also benefits our community in Scotts Valley as well as the county. So that's my sure. position. Um, well, we're going to go around for a second round. I'll just say that uh, I support Mr. Bottorf's uh, motion. Uh, Mr. Bottorf, then Mr. Bertrand. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify. You know, it, it, the document we have, these are the RTC regulations, and it, it's pretty clear in here that the intention of this provision is to maintain the priorities. And, and to, uh, to Mr. Mulhern's point, you know, I, I think that when we have a document that gives us guidelines, we should try to follow that. If we have a problem with this document, then that's what this board should change that if we feel that there's something coming up. But I think to go against the document when there's not a clear priority here, and we can say that, it doesn't make us consistent. So I think being consistent is what's important, and uh, hopefully that will, that will prevail. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bertrand. Uh, the policy of the RTC board represents the RTC's commitment to the metro and to the community to provide uh, robust um, transportation that's dependable. Um, I think we've also had a talk here at this chamber about how effective buses are in reducing um, congestion on the freeway. And one of the main deterrents to people using buses is lack of good service. It's not only buses breaking down, but it's also the frequency of service. I think in the long run, we would do best to really support Metro as much as possible. So I'm definitely for a Bottrop's motion. Okay, Mr. Schifrin. <coughs> yes, thank you. I just, I wasn't going, since you're doing a second round, I didn't feel the need for a second round until uh, I felt I needed to respond to some of the uh, additional comments. The reason why the policy allows for flexibility is so that the commission has some flexibility. If the commission just wanted to give the money to the metro, the policy would say the money will go to metro, period. Uh, there was a whole lot of discussion over, the, uh, over this policy, and it was felt that sometimes there are good reasons to use that money for other purposes. As staff has said, this is not uh, unique. Uh, generally, the, com the commission has allocated the money to Metro, but it doesn't always do that. And it depends on what the circumstances are at the time. And it just seemed to me that in a year where um, the sales tax revenue is good and the uh, Metro is getting a half cent of it, when they're getting, uh, Metro is getting extra $700,000 in STA money, uh, when the Measure D money is starting to come through, and I think Metro is getting about 15 percent of that, that this was, a, this was a relatively good year for Metro. Do they have additional needs? Of course they have additional needs. Everybody has additional needs. The city of Watson was talking about how they're at 57 percent uh, or 50 percent seven on their street maintenance. They need more money for street maintenance. Uh, we got a report on how the uh, city is doing a num number of bike and pedestrian um, uh, projects, as are all the jurisdictions. These are all high priorities, and it just seemed that for one year to take what, um, you know, a, 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 a $298,000 surplus and distribute it to the local jurisdictions who are, at the, who are at the end of the line always in terms of money for their uh, bike and pedestrian projects, that it was not an unreasonable request to make. So that's why um, it was recommended and um, I still think it's the, the correct thing to do this year. Okay. Um, Real quick. We want, uh, all right, we're going right to that second round, I guess. No, I, I was just going to say, I know where we can find a quick $200,000 to solve all our problems. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not taking other motions at the, um, <laughs> uh, at the moment. Um, uh, I, 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 would, I will agree with Mr. Schifrin that we, that we have a policy that gives us a flexibility to make these decisions. And w wherever we end up here today, it, 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 it is in keeping with our policy um, that we have that flexibility. So first we're gonna vote on Mr. Schifrin's amendment, which is to go back to the uh, uh, staff recommendation um, or, and the, or the budget and policy 
uh, committee and staff recommendation. If that uh, fails, then we will vote on Mr. Bator's motion. If it, if it passes, we will not vote on Mr. Bator's motion. So is everybody clear? So on, uh, on the uh, motion to amend the motion, uh, in which means you're in favor of Mr. Schifrin's motion, uh, say aye. 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 Maybe we better raise our hand so uh, the uh, um, so that we can see, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Caput, Mr. Schifrin, uh, and those who are no. The noes have it. The, I, I'll ask if there's any abstentions. I hope not. But uh, <laughs> then uh, then we will go to Mr. Bottorf's uh, motion, which is to make a change in the TDA fund. Uh, for a small amount for the bike signage and the rest to be gone by allocation uh, of, uh, of, of how we spend our TDA funds to the three organizations. All in favor? Uh, could I get a clarification because that's not really what Mr. Bartoff said. Yeah. Um, as I understood the motion, there would be no, under his motion, there would be no money for the local jurisdictions. All of it would go either to bike signage or to metro yeah. um, lift line, and um, yeah, I, th I think that's what. Uh, I, 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 sorry if I misunderstood. Under the that. normal TDA distribution guidelines, which I believe are in section, you did, you which did is eighty-five point whatever percent to. Yeah, there, uh, there was a small carve out that you. There is a small carve out in it that goes to the states. It, it's wasn't really worth mentioning. It's not in the nature yeah. of thirteen thousand yeah. dollars. It could be, be a thousand. Clear so staff knows what you yeah. want us okay. to do. Yeah. Under the normal TDA distribution, okay. That's what you want. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Okay. And is there a carve out for jurisdictions? Yes, there is a small amount that goes oh, to jurisdictions. Right. Yes. Thank you. All right. So are we clear on what the motion is? I'm seeing a little qui quizzical face. Okay. So there's a small carve out for the bike signage program and then the rest would go by the distribution formula. So the, the small car route is the 48,000 you mentioned? Yes. And then the rest would go as to the normal yeah. TDA distribution. Okay, thank you. We all clear? Oh. This is 48 on top of the amount that's recommended in the staff report. Correct. So it's like 90,000 to the bike signage program. 96. 96,000. 96, I matched it. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Was it the three the three no's who were also the three yeses on the on the amendment? Patrick. Oh, four. Patrick. Yeah, no. yeah. Oh, Patrick is also a no. Did I get everybody who was a no? There were four no's. There were four no's, we right? Mulhern, Caput, Schifrin, and Johnson. As clear as mud. All right, <laughs> uh, Mr. Bertrand. I want to thank Mr. Schifrin for his uh, motion because it expanded the conversation and that was greatly appreciated. Well, next, we'll move on to a review of items to be discussed in closed session. Wait, did we, did we vote on? That, that was voting on the whole budget. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, we do have a closed session <coughs> schedule for you today. Um, the first item, uh, conference of council will not be necessary uh, this morning, but we will need the item for conference with the real proper negotiator. Uh, and it does have to do with the Santa Cruz branch rail line. Your agency negotiators are uh, uh, your executive director and deputy director. Uh, negotiating parties are not listed on, on your agenda, but they are, of course, the Regional Transportation Commission. And it's also the, uh, make sure I get the name correct here, I believe it's the Hall Family Trust. Um, that is correct, the whole family trust. Okay, is there anyone who would like to address us on items in closed session? I don't see anyone. It, will this re, it, will the, it, anything be reportable? We don't expect that to be the case. We don't expect that to be the case. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Our next meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission is back here in Watsonville on Thursday, November 15th. It is an evening meeting. Uh, six o'clock, we will be taking testimony on the Unified Corridor Investment Study. I look forward to seeing everyone there.